On June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. He was assassinated as nationalism grew in Serbian hearts, thus pushing them to the point of committing this offensive act. Outraged, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and as an ally of Serbia, Russia promised support against Austria-Hungary. Germany, an ally of Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia, taking Russia's promise as an act of war. Germany declared war on France, another ally of Russia, and as a flanking move on France, invaded Belgium. Britain, an ally of Belgium, declared war on Germany, and as such, it became the First World War. As Australia was a colony of Britain, the population at the time took the act of war to heart, believing that they had to prove themselves as a nation. Many thousands of Australians enlisted, including the following people from Pol Bay. Stanley Curry was born in Birragara on February 11th, 1896, the son of William and Isabel Curry, who immigrated from Ireland. Stanley attended the Bowen Down State School and then moved with his family to Tuxin and later to a property on the Barham River Road. He grew up working on his father's dairy farm. On 24th of May 1916, at the age of 20 years and 3 months, Stanley enlisted in Geelong in the Australian Imperial Forces and he was deemed fit for active service. His first training unit was the 19th Depot Battalion in Geelong until he was transferred to Seymour Army Training where he was placed in the 2nd Pioneer Regiment as a private. With three destroyers as an escort, they finally arrived in Plymouth, England on the 9th of January 1917. The journey had taken two and a half months. From early January 1917 until February 1918, Stanley trained in various camps in England as a signaller. On the 19th of February, he proceeded to France and was placed in the 6th Battalion. Stanley fought in the fields of France until he suffered from the results of a gas attack on the 31st of August 1918. He returned to Australia and was discharged from the armed services in April 1919. After the war, Stanley purchased a property on the Kalala Road in Nepal Bay and later married Grace Cockrell. The couple had two sons. Charlotte Ramson was one of the two women from Polarvane District who enlisted in World War I armed services. She is amongst the 12 women in this photo. Charlotte was born in Geelong in 1889, the seventh child to Edward Plum Ramsden and Frances Elizabeth Kelly. The family were one of the early farming pioneers of the Pole Bay, taking up land at Cape Patton in the 1880s. Her enlistment records show she trained as a nurse at St Margaret's Private Hospital in Melbourne and was a spinster aged 26 when she enlisted on the 19th of December 1915. She was to serve in the Hospital Transport Corps as a probationary nurse. She embarked on the 22nd of December 1915 from Sydney on the HMA HS Kernona. Victor Charles Kaywood left his home, Beechworth Cottage, a pole bay, to enlist for active service on the 10th of February 1916. Victor spent a few months training in Seymour before departing from Melbourne on HMAT Persic on 3rd of June 1916 for Great Britain. Victor was to keep a diary of his wartime experience, which without emotion describes his daily life for over two years. He was sent to Amentiers on the Western Front, where, according to Victor, saw very marked signs of war. Everywhere one chose to look, there were huge shell holes, barbed wire, and trench systems. We went into the trenches between this and the new year. So commenced the season of 1917 by having a New Year's dinner in the trenches under difficulties, or rather, I should say, shells. As we were dodging around the boys with a mess tin of stew in one hand and a piece of pudding in the other, so it was rather a lively spread. 
We had the usual snow and rain day after day and soon got used to living the duck's life. By February, they are getting ready for a raid. Victor describes what happened after they reached the trenches where they were to mount the attack. I was hit four times in succession. I had just thrown my sixth bomb into his trenches when a piece of shrapnel penetrated my right wrist to the bone. I had enough then. Blood was running freely from a couple of places, but that didn't matter much. The trouble was getting back to our own trenches. I was getting back when I came across one of my mates, a scout. He was badly wounded and paralyzed from the hips down, so he couldn't move. He asked me not to leave him on Fritz's wire. I asked him what he took me for. I couldn't pick him up as I had no strength in my arms for lifting. I got down on my hands and knees, then he pulled himself up onto my back. I couldn't get up as I was worn right out, so then commenced a ticklish job of crawling back across no man's land with my mate on my back. Victor was to recover from his wounds. Unfortunately, his mate did not. Charles Stanford was the son of Albert and Elizabeth Stanford, who were the owners of the Eldersley Guest House from the early 1900s until the 1920s. Charles attended school at Apollo Bay and Skeens Creek, then worked as a lay preacher and dairy farmer until his enlistment on 31st of July 1915 in the World War I Armed Services at the age of 21 years and 7 months. Charles fitted all the requirements for a young soldier. He was 5'11 tall, had a chest measurement of 35 to 37 inches and was the right age. He was an excellent shot having trained at the local Apollo Bay rifle range and on the farm. Training camps were set up near all major cities and Charles was sent to Seymour Army Camp. On the 9th of December 1915, he was deemed ready for active service and appointed to the 23rd Depot Battalion in Royal Park, awaiting transfer overseas. In January 1916, he embarked on HMAT Afric and was taken on strength to the 8th Battalion for the 24th refurbishment. In June 1916, he was sent for duty to France where he operated a machine gun. In July 1916, he was wounded in action, suffering a mild wound to his left hand and was treated in a French hospital. The wound was later recorded as severe and, a few days later, Charles was transferred to England where he spent a number of months recuperating. On the 30th of March 1917, he received shrapnel wounds to his right hand while in action and was sent to the war hospital in Reading. Charles served on command to the Australian Corps until 4th of July 1918 when he was again wounded in action. This time the wounds to his arm and head proved fatal. Jim Turner was 24 years old when he enlisted in January 1915. Both his parents had died and he was working at one of the sawmills near Apollo Bay. He was one of the crowd that drank at the Apollo Bay Hotel apparently not too well thought of by some in the town. While away at war, Jim was to exchange letters with the Pengilly family. Will and Caroline Pengilly were licensees of the Apollo Bay Hotel, and many of the young men who drank there called Caroline mother, and their youngest daughters were treated like sisters. Jim was in the D Company Battalion, 2nd Infantry Brigade of the 1st Australian Division at Gallipoli. In a letter dated October 7th, 1915, he writes, Dear Mrs. Penn, just a few lines to let you know that I'm still in the land of the living and well, and hope you're all the same. We are on Lamnos Island resting at present and having a fair time, but you have got to make your own fun. That is not hard to do when there is a big crowd of men. I had two months in the trenches. It is not so bad, only for lice and flies. But a charge, on the other hand, it is worse than getting chased by Joe Hay with the local fleeceman. I was in the supports at Lone Pine Charge. I suppose you read about it in the papers. Our battalion lost pretty heavy, especially A and B companies in the bombardment before and after the charge. You could see men getting killed right and left, some with the head blown off, some a leg or arm, but I was lucky to come out without a scratch. But I need not scot. I might get bowled over when I get back again, and I don't think that will be long now, as we have had about a month's holiday, but I could do with another month. 
Jim was evacuated on February 1916 and spent a few weeks in Egypt before being sent to France. Sadly, Jim was killed in action in France on July 25th, 1916. A year after the start of World War I, Clarence Perkins was working at a timber mill at Stalker. Stalker was between Lavers Hill and Beach Forest. Deciding to enlist in the army, he walked to Apollo Bay to get his father's consent to enlist in the army. Receiving his consent, the next day he walked to Beach Forest. Although only 18, he gave his age as 19 and presented himself for examination. He was passed as quite fit to fight for his country, given a rail pass, the next day was at the St Kilda Road Army Headquarters. It was September 1915 when he went into training. He embarked from Melbourne on 7th of March 1916 to join the 15th reinforcement of the 6th Battalion at Gallipoli. However, the evacuation took place before they got there, so they landed in Egypt and were trained for the artillery and then sent to France and Armentiers. Ted's war was spent along the French and Belgian borders. In August 1918, he was wounded. A communication to his father dated 6th of January 1919 reads, Dear Sir, I now beg to advise you that with reference to my memos of the 18th of October and 3rd of December concerning driver C.M. Perkins, correct disability should read gunshot wound head and gunshot wound left thigh. Ted's version of receiving these wounds told in his memoirs says, well, a shell landed at my feet, and that finished the war for me. It put a hole through my leg, and a large piece of shell got me in the head. This jagged piece broke a small hole near the hairline above my ear. Funny thing about this, years later after I was married, the wound festered, and May, my wife, pricked it out with a needle, and a piece of shrapnel popped out. After I was wounded, I was sent to a hospital in London. Ted returned to Australia on the hospital ship Orantes, and was discharged the day they landed in Melbourne. Ted was fit enough to take up civilian life in Apollo Bay, first assisting with the surveying of the roads and cutting timber for the butter factory. He was then to take up farming, renting Glen Lovey, his father's farm.